we're going to take a look at uh, power and politics in, the, in this session. And first of all, we'll take a look at how we define power. So power basically is my ability to get you to do something which you wouldn't otherwise have done. And it involves lots of the terms that you see on the, the slide in front of you, but other, but it's very difficult to escape that basic def definition of power. I can, I have power to the degree that I'm able to get you to do something that you wouldn't have done uh, already. So it's often connected with influence and to some degree influence suggests something approaching power that I can affect the way something happens and I can encourage maybe even promote something influence falls a little bit short of power in the sense that I'm almost another one of the variables that adds to the decision. Whereas power is basically, I can get you to do it. Um, influences whether I can actually add weight to your going one way or the other. We attribute conformity with the way we get people to behave in a certain way. So conformity is induced in organizations quite a lot through the rules and regulations of the organization. You can see this around uh, dress codes. You can see this around uh, meeting behaviors. And sometimes conformity can go even further in terms of agreement with superiors. Compliance means you give in to me. You comply with the thing I'm asking you to do, which could be an implicit request, like I don't, ex I don't say it, I don't state it out, or an explicit request, I state it out. And that tends to be in a lot of social situations in organizations. Obedience tends to attend around issues where I have legitimate authority to ask you to do something, no matter where in the hierarchy you are. So people in charge of health and safety um, usually can get us to comply with things, but obedience is much more where somebody has legitimate authority to get me to do something like my boss. So my boss makes a demand, I usually offer up obedience. The health and safety officer makes a demand, I might comply or I might not. Um, and the request might be implicit as well as explicit. Um, it's not quite the same because there isn't that same legitimate relationship. And when we're on legitimate relationships, giving somebody authority, in other words, that's what we do as managers. We appoint them to managerial positions and they're able to uh, exercise some kind of control over uh, their staff, their subordinates because and the resources because of that position we give them. So it's known as legitimate power. We talked earlier in the, in the module about French and Raven and the sources of power. Um, academics don't like it. Uh, they tend to shy away from power. They tend not to discuss it. Uh, very few people specialize in the writing in academic works on power. And largely because a lot of power is seen, the exercise of power is seen as, as quite negative in organizations. And there's an expectation by some sections that in a just world, there wouldn't be the need for this. You would just be, um, 
you would just be able to uh, achieve your results through hard work, your skill, your endeavor, and your intelligence. Um, whereas what upsets people is that organizations are already political entities and the exercise of power, where it's not given legitimacy by the organization, is certainly not stamped out by the organization. So you see the coercive, legitimate, expert, referent, and reward, information power, handy adds in a sixth form negative power. Subunits can have tremendous power in organizations because they can manage uncertainty. Um, people who are expert in a really important part, actuaries in, um, in uh, uh, and asset managers, uh, people who have high technical knowledge in a space, especially if there's a, very, a lot of volatility around, the high technical knowledge people can manage the uncertainty. Um, people who control resources or generate them. Um, so when, uh, when I worked in, in consulting, the ability to generate, to make, be a rainmaker, uh, to generate uh, resources uh, gave a significant amount of power. Uh, other people are, are non-substitutable. They're just perhaps too expert, um, perhaps even too dynamic uh, to be substituted. And there are individuals who are, are central to the information flow um, and transformation process. These are people who are often at the core of change processes, or even people who are in the structure who are core to the information flow throughout the organization, like PAs to very important people, very, very um, senior people. Unobtrusive power, uh, cultural power and unobtrusive power. Cultural power can often be individuals who have uh, a real deep knowledge of how the culture or, uh, functions and can therefore explain events and predict events, and look around corners. Um, unobtrusive power can often be exercised by people who are in advisory positions, perhaps secretarial positions, who can write things, frame things. People who are charged with writing terms of reference can often have an unobtrusive power in the way they frame issues. Um, they can actually influence how things are considered. So agents who are bringing around some kind of compliance, what they, they, they tend to use various tools. Obviously, uh, when right is on your side, um, rationality can help a lot. Um, and if not, um, incentives and pressures uh, you exchange uh, by putting incentives uh, in the way of somebody. Uh, ingratiation, ingratiation really works. Uh, praising and flattering people uh, really works. Uh, nobody ever walked out on a round of applause. But assertiveness works also, as any five-year-old will tell you, uh, constantly repeating demands um, and possibly even a few threats uh, really works. Uh, engaging with parties, other parties, who may be able to show that there is a coalition and a strong, broad consensus around something that, that can really be useful. And an upward appeal is just basically going over somebody's head and making sure that um, everybody knows that you have the agreement of the top person. Obviously, targets can, uh, can join up with you if they feel consulted. Um, and that's quite a typical way of, of gaining people's influence. Um, the great, the great uh, leader theory uh, talks about the vision and the inspirational appeal uh, that people use to influence. There's also a personal appeal. If people like you, or if you've got a good relationship with people, you can uh, gain commitment. The experts on the organization's rules can influence others by legitimating their behaviors through quoting rules and norms and policies. And collaboration is often powerfully used by people who are quite savvy around behavioral science. And 
find that they're able to influence people by giving them autonomy and power around decision making. Obviously, every supervisor knows how to apprise people by pointing out the benefits uh, to agreeing with them. And self-promotion is another way of influencing. And self-promotion is even better if you can contract with somebody else to promote you. In other words, you promote yourself by using a third party to do it. Partly a coalition, but um, there are many stories told about senior managers who at a very young age identify the fact that if they, they can self-promote by getting a trusted colleague to promote them. Influence mechanisms can promote um, automatic response patterns, and that increases the likelihood of, of acquiescing with influence attempts. So um, Chialdini, uh, who is uh, quite well known for his books on leadership and one of the more recent ones is, is called Persuasion. So it's about leadership, uh, persuading uh, individuals uh, through things like reciprocity. Um, the, the idea of social exchange norms in that most people, when they receive something from someone, are automatically inclined to reciprocate. Um, Consistency and commitment, it definitely individuals are more trustworthy or quite consistent and, and committed. Um, social proof, obviously, is being able to uh, give some kind of, of uh, evidence that what you've got is, is going to work. Uh, liking, authority and scarcity are obviously things that we talked a little bit about in terms of sources of power already. In terms of politics in organizations, uh, one of the reasons why politics um, is seen as negative by many writers is because it is negative. Um, so it's a case of uh, uh, people shy away from it. Uh, they don't like it. They think it's always the dark art. Machiavelli wrote The Prince. Uh, Machiavelli in Rena Renaissance Italy wrote The Prince, but he celebrated the work of politicians in organizations, he celebrated. And he basically wrote The Prince as a kind of um, a handbook for anyone who would want to exercise power in organizations. So although there's a negative power, there's a completely other view of power as something that is normal as breathing um, and living to, to organizations. Everybody recognizes that it's good and bad, um, but also that it can be important, maybe, maybe uh, we should be calling it an inevitable part of the, the experience of being um, at work. And therefore, political behavior is deliberately designed um, actions to, add, to, to promote your, your own interests to whatever degree it, it aligns with other people's interests. Obviously, the best form of political behavior is when somebody doesn't know you're doing it uh, and will never find out. Whereas uh, it often still doesn't matter. And some actors, some political actors are quite happy to be very explicit about showing their power um, to try and communicate the, the strengths that they have. There are offensive strategies like the building the co coalitions and uh, like changing the rules, like setting the procedures, and they're designed to limit other people's um, freedoms to attack your freedoms to, uh, to achieve their own results. Defensive strategies are often um, ones by which you, will, uh, you look after yourself. One of the defensive strategies I used to do in all organizations I worked in was I found out um, pet headache of, of the top person uh, that I could influence in some way and that nobody else seemed to be taking up an interest in. It didn't have to be an enormous thing, but it, it, uh, it might be something that the, uh, the leader had promised to the community but uh, wasn't able to deliver on it. And I would often find a way with my budget as um, operations manager or group uh, learning and development manager or something to bring out, to bring something to bear on that headache. Uh, 
Miraculously, I used to find later on is that if a threat ever um, raised its head anywhere about me, that it was closed down um, quite quickly by that senior person. And it's usually, um, and usually all that happens without anybody seeing it. Uh, it's just that everybody around the table just knows um, that you, you, you shouldn't raise that again. Um, so, and uh, neutral strategies really are, are often um, just about uh, playing it straight. Um, many people who dislike politics um, try to adopt neutral strategies and it's rather challenging to do that. So, by a combination of all these tactics, what you're trying to do is you're trying to influence what other people do in your favor. Uh, you may be doing soft influence, you may be doing naked power, but what you're actually trying to do is you're trying to play the chess pieces so that ultimately you arrive at a checkmate in your favor. And all of these tactics are employed by individuals somewhat skillfully, uh, sometimes not so skillfully. And political behavior can often be the control of information. Maybe I'll starve you of information if I, if I feel that I need to bring it to the table or bring it to my way of thinking. Um, senior managers are often able to commission outside reports uh, to change this, the discourse on something so that uh, it now becomes well known that this is the way because we can also I'll rely on this research to tell us that the manager, the senior manager is always right. And people play games, um, they play games at meetings um, and that's often political behavior about frustrating opposition to themselves or uh, changing the way people think about things. Obviously the coalitions we talked about. Control of communication channels is, uh, is really important and in an organization such as a university, there can often be very, very tight control over there the communications channels that you can use. Um, control over work and meeting agendas, and you're very well aware of that you can actually win the meeting but lose the minutes. Um, and if you can't even get near the agenda, then you have a very, um, uh, you have a very limited opportunity to influence what's going on in the organization. So obviously impression and image management goes on all the time. And control over decision-making criteria. If somebody sets the term, if somebody can set the terms of reference of the discussion, then they have really huge control over what's got to be decided. Um, there, there are organizational tactics at the top of this table, and there are individual tactics which are associated uh, with increased uh, political behavior. So the the, uh, the tactics at the top are organizational tactics and and organizational factors which are um, located, which are associated with increased political behavior. And the two main ones at the top really are, are scarcity issues and uh, where there are high stakes issues. So it's, it's, it's almost mandatory that um, inevitable that political behavior emerges whenever there's scarcity around something important. Um, or whenever the stakes become high around something. And the political behavior then just naturally flows from that situation. Um, in terms of uh, the factors that are associated with increased political behavior by, by individuals, a lot of that tends to be around uh, individual um, leanings, uh, whether or not they've got an internal locus of control. People have an internal locus of control who actually think they can, uh, they can uh, achieve change they get drawn towards political behavior. Um, if they have huge skills, they get drawn towards huge political skills, they get drawn towards political behavior. So some of the, uh, the factors that cause individuals to do it are within the individuals themselves. In managing the office politics, um, even if you're doing it remotely, um, some of the best ways is to come forward with a clean pair of hands because Politicians can also can develop a toxicity about them. Um, but if people are always very transparent, 
if good politicians are very transparent about, about their actions, they can actually thrive and survive. And that includes being very communicative with everybody. One I love the best is networking extensively. It's, 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 it's mapping out the people I need to achieve my uh, results in a broad range of situations, going and making sure that I actually have a decent relationship with those people and that I can actually pick up the phone or, or, or pop, pop a mail to them and ask for something um, without the house falling down around them. Obviously, keeping yourself well informed and watch the politicians. Uh, it's really important because they're the ones doing all the action. Um, obviously, never get personal. Um, contacts we talked about. Anticipate what other people will do and use the listening techniques we talked about to manage your own reaction before you manage their reaction. And obviously performance forgives so much that I remember one, one time when I joined IMI, there was issues around um, the kind of, uh, let's call it the modern attire I was wearing. And uh, I remember this coming up for discussion at, at, the, at the board meeting, how it got there, I have no idea, but maybe, this was back in the days of, of 1990, maybe it was uh, 30 years ago. So it was probably maybe something, anyway, somebody maybe didn't like me. And, uh, but it got closed down really quickly when somebody said, they said look at its figures. So um, but in other words, like if you're, if you're making rain, if you're the rainmaker and, uh, and you do something which is against the culture, it's a great forgiveness if you're really making rain for you. People are getting bonus because of your hard work. Um, it forgives so much. And obviously everything that's written to you, keep a record. Uh, that's a really important thing. Uh, and if people promise you things, um, tell them you'll move on it as soon as you receive the email. Uh, 